Hello everyone. Welcome back to the channel. If this is your very first time here and you enjoy horror stories, you should subscribe and join our channel down below. I upload every day. Please drop a like on today's video to show your support. Thank you. Let's begin. After college, I spent a long time moving from place to place. Once I could get my life together, I rented an apartment. No one could understand how happy I was. It sounded ridiculous to many people, so I never told anyone why. The apartment wasn't a big place, it was a small apartment, but for one reason, it was the best. Regardless of the size, the apartment was decent. I felt that way because I owned a place that I could call my own, even though the only things I really kept were clothes and books. And yes, I guess you could say technically I didn't own it, I was renting. I owned it for that month anyway. Once I paid, it was mine for 30 days. Most people didn't realise what a big deal that was for me. It made me feel like I had finally something tangible to call mine. Which made me feel accomplished, precisely what I needed to keep myself sane. I lived alone now and had no friends because I didn't need any. My life was simple, everything was organised around work and being alone. That was all I wanted, so why should I, well, care? Why should my life be anything special? I was just fine. Late one night, when I returned from work, I was searching for my keys in my purse when I heard someone whispering. I turned around but no one was there, so I thought that I was the one with the hearing problems. I thought perhaps I was imagining things. I brushed the thought off and went into my apartment. I couldn't hear the voice anymore, so I guessed it was just me. I sat on my couch thinking of everything my colleagues at work said. They asked me why I kept to myself most of the time, and I've worked there for over a year and seven months without a proper conversation with anyone really. Of course. There was no way I could tell them that I didn't want to be bothered by their presence. So I just told my colleagues that I love spending time with my thoughts. That's all. I made up some nonsense that I write books in my spare time and it takes up all my spare time. They just knew I loved being alone and I was okay with it. Sometimes I'd stay out later than necessary. I'd leave at 2 in the morning and come home late. It wasn't that I had a lot going on, but I needed it sometimes. Obviously, they didn't believe a single word I said, but no one questioned it. I met Paul several times in the hallway. He was my neighbour. He was always smiling, so I guessed he was a happy dude. We talked a few times, but the things we talked about were insignificant, so I treated them like things we say to our neighbours. Just small talk, really. I got close to someone from work when I heard her play a song by my favourite band, and when I say close, I talked to her for five minutes instead of one. We started talking and became quick friends. After a month, I invited Sarah back to my apartment. Her roommate wanted the place for herself, and Sarah had nowhere else to go, so I reluctantly told her that she could stay at mine till it was a time for her to head back home. Once we got to my place and I tried opening the door, we heard the whispers like last time. Unlike me, Sarah wanted to know what it was. Did you hear that? Sarah asked while we stood outside my apartment. Hear what? I asked, trying to pretend like nothing happened. Just listen, she said. We both waited. There it was again. It wasn't anything scary. It felt like someone was trying to say something, but we couldn't determine what was being said. I was achieving huge goals of my own, and my anxiety was through the roof, allowing people around my apartment. I stared at Paul's apartment, 
as I wondered who he whispered to. I thought he lived alone, but that's the problem. Me and Sarah were almost certain that the whispers were coming from his apartment. We heard it again, but had no idea what was being said. You have weird neighbours, she said. We walked into my apartment, ate dinner and laughed about stupid things at work. She asked me if I had a boyfriend, and I told her no, no I didn't. I figured that was the case, but it's okay, she said after talking for a while. We fell asleep on the couch on each other. I know this is so weird, but Sarah was one of those people that got me to open up. She made me feel comfortable, she made me feel friendly, and it reminded me of a close friendship I had when I was younger at high school. Her name was Evelyn. I used to basically live with her. I saw a piece of Evelyn in Sarah, and it just made me crumble inside. Sarah left the next day, first thing in the morning once we woke up. I was off work that day, so I decided to sit back and relax. A knock on my door was able to draw me out of my reverie. I contemplated that I was answering for a while, hoping whoever it was would leave. I'd had enough people for one day, and although Sarah had got on my good side, I felt exhausted talking so much and being in the presence of someone for almost a whole 15 hours. The knock became persistent. I shot up and answered the door. It was Paul. He looked pretty mad at something, but I had no idea what that was. Hi, sorry to bother you, but I wanted to let you know that you were pretty loud with your friend last night. I would appreciate if you guys keep it down next time. I don't like noise. His voice was close to a whisper, and it resembled the voices I heard every night. He was patronizing and pissed off. I could tell for certain. Uh, sorry about that. I will try and keep it down next time, I replied with a smile. I watched a frown on his face disappear instantly, replaced with a smile. Thank you. I watched Paul retreat into his apartment. I pushed the thought that he was just being weird. Sarah and I were quiet last night, but it was okay. Nothing unusual had happened. It was probably my imagination. A week ended up passing after this encounter. Not much has changed since then. The same things happen every day, except it feels different. Every time Paul knocks at my door, I feel nervous and paranoid, like something's watching me from behind, waiting for me to do something that isn't normal. A week ended up passing. I remember it vividly. I was sat on my front desk. A person was standing by the front door, knocking. I dragged myself off the chair and answered it. It was Paul. This time he looked different. His hair was messy and his eyes looked like they would pop out at any moment. Could you stop all that talking? I can't. I can't focus on them. I don't know what you do. Stop it. Paul turned and walked away, leaving me dumbfounded without even a chance to reply. The sarcasm had gone. Now it was just pure rage. I don't particularly appreciate being bothered about things, I was sure I never did. I thought about reporting him a few times to the landlord, but I remembered that he lost his wife and kids, so maybe he was still grieving. One night I got home from work late, opened my door and heard the whispers yet again. I wanted to know what they talked about this time, so I investigated. I placed my head on the door to his apartment and listened. She killed her best friend. She is evil. I can't do anything because no one would believe Dennis killed Carla. I jumped away from the door. My breathing was heavy. How did he know who Carla was? My mind yelled at me to run. I wanted to, but I wanted to know. I didn't want to leave anything unanswered. Denise told everyone in 
was an accident, but I know it's not. She pushed Carla off the cliff, leaving Carla couldn't swim. No, I whispered. It seemed like he heard me, because I couldn't hear the whispers anymore. They stopped. I heard footsteps approach the door, so I ran into mine. Carla was my name. Denise was his dead wife's name. Paul knocked on my door. Too scared to act, I ran into the kitchen and hid under the table. Denise, can I talk to you? He called, his voice sounding firm. I was still trembling, terrified and so confused. What should I do? I heard my front door open. I didn't lock the door. Crap. How stupid was I? The door creaked open and he peeked into the room, looking around carefully before stepping inside. I could see him from the view in the kitchen, but I know he couldn't see me because of how low down I was. There were a bunch of boxes either side underneath the kitchen table that acted as cover for me. I heard the floorboards creak as Paul stepped into my apartment. I didn't move. I kneel there frozen in fear under the kitchen table. All of a sudden it goes silent. I can't see him anywhere. The next thing I realize, he grabbed the edge of the table that I was hiding underneath and tries to pull it aside. It was you, wasn't it? Paul asked, ignoring everything else. His eyes were so fixed on mine. What do you want? I asked, trying to move away from him, but I had nowhere to run. You killed Carla, didn't you? He asked me, with a tone of sadness, anger and regret. I shook my head, denying it, but he came closer. Finally, I started to move back, trying to put space between myself and this mad man. It was an accident. You weren't there, he yelled. Scared for my life, I was thinking of what to do next as he approached me slowly. That girl didn't deserve to die. You were supposed to protect her. How could you do such a thing? Stop defending yourself. Do you think you're some saint? I whimpered at the sound of his voice. His deathly glare, drain, stopped me from making any sudden movement. That's why you ran away from your family. You wanted to escape to a place no one knew what you did. I won't let you. Paul picked me up and tossed me across the living room. I landed on my side and the pain exploded all over my body. I tried my hardest to breathe. I sat up and saw him walking towards me again. I crawled backwards as fast as possible, trying to get far away. Paul grabbed me by the shirt, lifted me from the ground and threw me against another wall. Why did you run away if it was an accident? You shouldn't be here. His words stabbed my heart like a dagger. I knew he meant and believed everything he said. The man was insane. I had nothing to defend myself with except my hands. I couldn't even fight back if I wanted to. As the gap closed between me and him, he edged ever closer, leaning forward. Both of his massive hands went round my neck and he began trying to squeeze my neck and bang my head against the wall. With every strength I could muster, I ended up leaning my body into him. I bit his arm till he let go of me and tried to run away. Before I could reach the front door, I felt him tug my shirt and toss me into the living room like an empty bottle. I slammed my back against the shelf. Sure, I had a few more broken bones. The pain became unbearable. I didn't mean to hurt Carla, I said. She was my best friend, I cried, pretending like I did do it. This was my last chance at surviving. The amount of pain I was in now, I was begging him with every ounce of my ability to beg to stop hurting me. Paul stared at me, but before he could do anything, I watched him being tackled to the floor. I saw in a split second in his eyes, when I admitted, 
and pretended that I was the one that killed her. I said sorry, and used my pain from the broken bones to cry a little more. I couldn't recognize who had tackled him to the floor, but someone else joined him and kicked the knife that he was holding out of his reach. The second guy pulled me from the floor onto my feet and pulled my hands behind my back while he helped me out of the apartment. It turns out that since the door was left open, some of the other residents and tenants of the apartment had heard what had happened. They had heard my screaming, my cries, my pleas for help. Someone did come to help. I was carried out of my apartment while two other men subdued Paul. They held him down. I remember hearing groans and grunts as they mustered and fighted with him. After this, the medics arrived. Everything was a blur and I was in so much pain. They gave me this gas to numb my pain. My whole body went lifeless. I had to have multiple operations because of my broken bones. My crazy next door neighbor Paul was sectioned in a mental asylum. Turns out he had severe schizophrenia, delusions, and anger management. I'd lived all my life with my parents in Georgia. Then, one Friday evening, when we were all sitting around the table having dinner, Dad decided to tell us some groundbreaking news. He said, I have been offered a very high profile job by my company. They would like me to become the head officer for their Florida operation in Tampa. It would mean if I accepted the position, that we would all relocate as a family to Tampa. The company has also stated that they would pay for all removal costs and would help in the purchase of any new house that we may find. He then went on to say that the news was a bit of a shock to him, but he would like us to consider it because he said that we could treat this as a new beginning and as no, well, we hadn't gone on holiday for a while in the past, and definitely to Florida, that we should all give it a try. Mum and I looked at each other and said okay. Then Mum asked Dad, how long before you have to let them know if you're going to accept the post? He said two weeks, and if it was a yes, then however long it took to purchase a property in Tampa. After a week had gone by, we had another meeting where we all accepted the idea of relocating to Tampa, Florida. I could tell Dad was very pleased that we had said yes, because he really wanted this position. Shortly after meeting Mum and Dad, they arranged to visit Tampa to look at suitable sales. This usually meant that they would go for long weekends, and then return on the Mondays with any information for me as to any suitable properties they were interested in. In the end, it took over a month to find a suitable property, but it was worth the wait, and mum and dad took me along for a second look to get my opinion. It was a four bed house that had a hot tub outside and a double garage. The gardens weren't that big, but the garden at the back was a bit bigger than the yard at the front. Inside it was modern, and all the rooms were quite spacious. Mum had fallen in love with the kitchen, which was double the size of our present one. Mum was such a good cook. Her food is the best I've ever tasted, and I've been out eating quite a bit. I gave the house my seal of approval, and after a bit of tough negotiating, Dad secured the purchase of the property. From that point on, we were very busy, having to put our present house up for sale and at the same time start to go through all the stored items that we had all accumulated over the years. Dad said we have to be strict with all this stuff if we don't use it, and we don't really need it, so 
anything you don't need or use, it just needs to be thrown away. We don't want to fill up the new house with the same stuff that just gets stored for the sake of it. It was quite a shock for me as I did not realise just how much stuff I had built up over the years. So, in the end, I had 15 boxes of stuff to get rid of. Some went to charity, and some broken items just went in the trash. Dad was nearly as bad as me, as he ended up 10 boxes of stuff to get rid of as well. Typical, Mum only had 3. After we had completed this, it was only a short time after that we got a good offer on the house which Dad eventually accepted. Then we set a date for removal. Within six weeks we were in the new house and living in rooms full of packing cases and eating takeaway meals. We must have lived off of TV dinners and takeaways for around 10 days till we could get the kitchen straight. But eventually we got ourselves organised. We noticed that Dad was having to spend longer at work as he was learning all the new systems and getting to know his operational team. He seemed to be enjoying the challenge. Meanwhile, I got myself a job working from home using my PC, which suited me fine compared to my office job I had back in Georgia. It meant I could break off from work and then go for a swim in our hot tub. The hot tub was super big. I wouldn't really call it a hot tub, it was more of a pool but the water was warm and it had a cover over the top, and those cool massage jet blasters. They were sick. I had some lunch on the patio, and then I'd go back to work. What a difference this used to feel. We had two properties near us, one on the either side. The house on our right was empty, and had a for sale board up in the front yard. You could see through the windows that the rooms were clear of all furniture. There were never any cars on the drive either. The house on our left was occupied, but the owner had never tried to speak to us since we moved in two weeks ago. We presumed it was only a man that lived there as we'd seen him driving in and out during the early evening, and he never had anybody in the car with him. I had waved at him on two separate occasions when he had been getting out of his car, but he just stared at me a little bit too long, and then just turned away each time. Mum said that some people are just strange, don't worry about it, there's always those people that hear you say hi or see you wave, and just choose to ignore you, perhaps it's how they brought up or their culture, that it's rude to actually say hi back, in whatever planet that is he lives on. In the evening, when I had been in bed around 11pm, I would often see a torchlight in his backyard. This was while I would look out my bedroom window towards the back of the property. I kept thinking to myself, what the hell is he doing? Then on a couple of occasions when I was watching the torchlight, it stopped moving down the yard and then turned sharply. Then the light shone straight at me in the window, causing me to duck and hold my breath. How the hell did he know I was looking at him? Because I always kept my head down when watching him, and had little to no light inside my bedroom. When I looked again, the torch light had always gone, and there was no sign of him. The other thing that I told mum was that he never seemed to go out during the day. I never heard him in the garden either, but mum as always would say, look, Darling, it's not our concern what he does, you worry about your own life, as long as he doesn't bother us. Then, one day, I was floating in the hot tub looking up at the blue sky, when some movement caught my eye along our fence line with his property. I pushed the water to move me around, so that I was pointing in the right direction. There was a ladder, a ladder on the top showing against the fence. Then, to my shock, I could see a man wearing a gas mask peering over the fence straight at me. He was holding the ladder with a large bright red rubber glove, and he seemed to be wearing some form of black plastic overalls. 
I stopped floating and stood up and stared back at him, to make it clear that I'd seen him. I then called out, Can I help you? He did not answer. He just kept on staring, and then he did the strangest thing. He lifted up a black cat from behind the fence. I could see that the cat was dead, either that or unconscious. He then pointed at me with his other hand, and made a cutting motion across his throat. He stopped, and then proceeded to climb back down and out of view, pulling the ladder under, under the fence. Who does something like that? I went up into my bedroom to get a better view of his rear yard and see what the bloody hell he was doing. However, when I looked out into the yard, the yard was empty. I would have told mum, but her and dad were away for the weekend, so it was only me in the house. That evening, I decided to do some detective work. I crept down to the bottom of our yard, where I knew that one of the fence panels was only held in by one fence post, as the other had been broken. Dad had actually mentioned it, and said it was on his to-do list to fix. I had with me a dim small flashlight which I had found in Dad's toolbox in the garage. I slowly moved the fence panel, just enough to slide my body through. Then I crouched down on the yard and scanned the area. I could now see his entire backyard more clearly. I could see there was a large garden shed which I had seen from my bedroom window. I crept towards it, keeping my head down. As I got closer to the ground, under my feet started to sink, and I saw that there were lots of fresh looking mounds spread all around. I tried to step carefully through them, until I reached the door at the shed. There did not seem to be a padlock or bolt on, so I tried the handle, and it opened easily. I stepped inside, and the first thing that hit me was the smell. I started to shine my flashlight around. I stopped on a large table in the middle of the shed. On that table was a large wooden butcher's board. It was covered in fresh blood, which was on the sides. As I moved the torch away, I could see on the floor that there were large red stains all around the table area and underneath it. On the wall at the back was a whole line of butchers meat choppers and knives. Then as I swung the beam around, to my horror it came to a stop on a whole line of meat hooks which had dead cats and small dogs hanging on it. This bastard's a complete head case. Then I noticed there were some pentagram signs painted on the back wall in what I thought at first was red paint but actually, on closer inspection, it was blood. This guy was into some sort of dark arts crap, and I presumed that he was carrying out some sort of sick sacrificing of these poor pets. What was more worrying was he was our neighbour. Suddenly, my eye caught sight of a light in the open shed door. Christ, he was coming down the garden. I shot out the door, as low as I could, and pushed the door to, and crawled through the bushes to the fence panel that I had pushed open earlier. I got through, I turned and pushed it back, and shot up the yard as fast as I could towards our house. I went through the patio door, and locked it behind me. I grabbed my phone from the table, and started dialing 911. But, to my horror, I saw that the man was walking up our yard, holding a meat cleaver in one hand. This time, he was dressed in all black. As I got connected, I screamed down the phone. We've got an armed intruder coming into the house. As I headed for the front door, I gave them the address, just as I heard the patio door smash. I ran out the front towards my car and then realised the keys were in the back door on a hook. That was it, I just had to run, so I set off down the road. 
I briefly looked back to see the figure standing in the front doorway. The next thing was, I nearly got run down around the corner by the police car responding to my call. I flagged them down and told them. They went in to arrest the guy, but he was injured, and he injured one of the policemen with the meat cleaver. It turns out that he was more than injured. Once he attacked the officers, they shot him dead at the scene. The police said, later, that they unearthed over 40 animal graves in his backyard. They also found lots of weird material and worship books in his house. Also, there was an open case of his mother, who had been reported missing four years earlier. It turns out that when you live next to creepy neighbours, sometimes you don't know they're creepy until it's too late.